always good to be with you in our Bible study as we study through the uh, Gospel of Mark. Uh, last week we looked at probably the, the key verse of this Gospel. Um, and it comes right in the middle of our study at the end of chapter 8. In verse 34, when Jesus defined for his closest associates, for his beloved disciples, what it actually means to be a follower of Jesus. If you'll remember, he said, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. So that, you know, that is a, a trademark teaching of Jesus. And it's one that was of course, not only for them, but for all of us today. So that one is extremely important to us. And before we go on today, I'd, I'd just like to review the three parts of that very quickly that we uh, talked about last week. So in order to be a disciple, Jesus says, first of all, there has to be self-denial. That means you have to surrender your life to Christ and, and uh, give it to him and let it be used by him in whatever way that he wants to. Uh, your own happiness can no longer be the supreme, supreme objective of your life. And that goes contrary to uh, all of our natural instincts, doesn't it? And then he says to take up your cross. And even though Jesus hadn't died on a cross yet, we talked about how the Jews knew exactly what that was because they'd seen hundreds if not thousands of their own people hanging on a Roman cross, giving up their life for being an enemy of the state. And then follow me, imitating Christ, following his example. Remember those uh, bracelets that used to be really popular? What would Jesus do? That has to be the cornerstone of our life and it has to influence every decision that we make. So it's probably the hardest of all. And uh, when we read the account in Luke that goes along with what we're studying in Mark, he says that we have to do that daily. It's not a one, once in a while thing. It's something that has to be each and every day of our lives. So we have to think about how many things do we deny ourselves today? If we want it and we can afford it, then we usually get it. Uh, if we are doing God's will, he's telling us that there's a real possibility that we're going to have to suffer in some way for that. Not that we go out and look for it, but that it may very well come our way and we need to be ready for it and we need to be able to handle that. Before we get started on today's lesson, which is going to start in verse two of chapter nine. Let's go to our heavenly father in prayer. Dear Lord, we're so very thankful for all the blessings you give us. And Lord, we're, we're very mindful of what you have told us that it takes to be your disciple, that it takes complete commitment in our lives. Father, we ask that you give us that strength, that endurance, that patience, that willingness to suffer on your behalf, that sense of giving up ourself to be used as an instrument of your righteousness in whatever way you see that is best for us to serve, Father. And we do this, Father, because of what you have done for us, that your son set that example that he was willing to come and die for us, that we might have everlasting life. And help us to keep that in the forefront of our minds, Father, as we travel through this journey on earth, which in reality is such a very short period of time compared to the glory of eternity. And so again, bless us, be with us in our study today, that we might uh, gain some further insights that will help us to be better disciples of yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Today we're going to be looking at that passage of scripture which is referred to as the transfiguration that 
word transfigure is actually used to describe uh, what goes on here. And it's a, it's a glorious picture that we see here, and it gives us some very good insights. I mean, what are some of the things that we wonder about heaven, most of all? Uh, who are we gonna know? What are we gonna look like? And this, I think, partially answers the question of what will we look like in our glorified state? So it's very interesting and very encouraging, I think, as we look at what happens here in uh, Mark chapter nine. And we're gonna be reading from verse two uh, down through verse 10. And six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and brought them up to a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his garments became radiant and exceedingly white, as no launderer on earth can whiten them. And Elijah appeared to them along with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to answer, for they became terrified. Then a cloud formed overshadowing them and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son, listen to him. And all at once they looked around and saw no one with them anymore, except Jesus alone. And as they were coming down from the mountain, he gave them orders not to relate to anyone what they had seen until the son of man should rise from the dead. And they seized upon that statement discussing with one another what rising from the dead might mean. Well, first of all, it's, it would be kind of interesting to note where this mountain is, where all of these things are happening, and it's not named in the scripture. The best guess that we can make for the Mount of Transfiguration is Mount Hermon. If you'll recall from last week, they were in the area and going through the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And Mount Hermon is about 15 miles northeast of there. It's also the highest place in Israel at over 9,000 feet. It's there at the base of the mountain that we have uh, the starting of the Jordan River as it will flow south from there. We note who is with Jesus his kind of his three favorites, aren't they? Peter, James, and John. You'll remember they were the only ones he took with him to uh, raise Jairus' daughter. And uh, they'll be the three whom he will take on further in the Garden of Gethsemane as he readies, readies himself for his sacrifice. The word transfigured, not one that we normally used. What it actually means is changed in form or appearance. Well, that's certainly what we see here. Uh, the bodies of those who live in the heavenly realms, I think are, we are probably to understand from this, are, are like what is being described here. Uh, they're pictured as glorious and shining in comparison with our physical bodies. And so, what happens to Jesus in this process, I think, is we're seeing what his glorified body, his spiritual state actually looks like. Now, his clothing becomes a brilliant white. And the terms that are used here suggest that it became as bright as pure light. It is a whiteness that no earthly process could hope to reproduce. There's no laundry detergent that we can go out and buy that are gonna make our clothing appear anywhere near what's being described here. And it was probably hard for the three apostles to even focus in on that. Uh, human eyes are going to have a lot of trouble focusing in on the glorified state. Let's turn over to Luke's account, Luke chapter nine, and verse 29. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face became different and his clothing became white and gleaming. 
So Luke adds a little more to the story here. We see that uh, Jesus is uh, praying while this process begins. And this whole, this whole scene takes a lot longer uh, than what is we read through that's described here. It, it's, it almost sounds as we read it through like it all happened very quickly. But this is a process that takes quite a long time. And uh, we see then that, that it happened to Jesus, that this transfiguration took place while he was praying. I think there is evidence here then that can tell us what our glorified bodies are going to look like. I think uh, we're being told that our identity will be preserved, that we will be able to recognize one another um, I really don't know if that's good news for me or not. I, I was hoping for something maybe a little better uh, to look at than what I presently have. But I think we're going to recognize one another in heaven. I think there's evidence of that here. Now, Elijah and Moses appear to them and uh, begin talking to Jesus. Why do you suppose that of all of the characters, all of the prophets, uh, throughout the history of the Old Testament and God's dealing with man, why do you think it's these two? What would be their significance? Well, the Old Testament is certainly about the law and the prophets, isn't it? And uh, who was the mediator of the law between God and the Jewish people? Well, of course, that was Moses. And then when you think about the prophets, who was the most revered, and the highest respected prophet throughout the Old Testament age? Well, it would most certainly be Elijah. He was looked upon by the Jews as the greatest of the prophets. And of course, as concerning Elijah, you'll recall that he didn't really die, did he? Now, he got to ascend to heaven in a chariot of fire. So that also lends special significance to him here. Now, many conclude of uh, because of what Luke says, that uh, they have come to encourage and to strengthen Jesus for the trials and sufferings that he's going to undergo in a pretty short time. Jesus' death would bring, of course, an end to that dispensation which Moses and Elijah represent. Let's look at a couple of passages about that. First one in Colossians chapter 2. And in Colossians 2, we're going to be looking at verses uh, 13 and 14. And when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us and which was hostile to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. One other one would be in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 19. What is the law then? It was added because of transgressions having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator, until the seed should come to whom the promise had been made. Now a mediator is not for one party only, whereas God is only one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? May it never be. For if a law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law. But the scripture has shut up all men under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith, which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. So that great change was about to happen. The law passing out of the way, not governing God's people anymore. 
And uh, this is a significant foretelling of that great event. Now back in our passage in Mark chapter nine, as we get down into uh, verse five, what is it that Peter is actually proposing here? Well, he's saying, well, Lord, let's put up some tents or something for each of you. Uh, this is such a glorious occasion. Let's prolong it. Uh, let's make some places of worship. So here we see that Peter's statement was probably not something well thought out. He's overcome with what he's seeing. Uh, it's almost like he's kind of babbling here, not really thinking about what he's saying. Good old impetuous Peter. Uh, so dumbstruck by what was happening uh, that this was something probably that he just blurted out. Looking again at Luke's account, chapter 9, and beginning in verse 30. And behold, two men were talking with him, and they were Moses and Elijah, who appearing in glory were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions had been overcome with sleep, but when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. And it came about as these were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, not realizing what he was saying. So Luke makes it more clear to us there, uh, doesn't he? Uh, the, these three disciples had just awakened uh, from sleep. And when we first wake up from sleep, uh, we're not always thinking really straight. And here he wakes up to this glorious sight of Jesus talking uh, to these two Old Testament heroes. Um, we also need to remember that just that morning they had uh, climbed a 9,000 foot mountain. So, uh, they were tired, uh, they, had be, they had gone to sleep, and they, they wake up to this marvelous scene. They'd probably been uh, praying with Jesus uh, when they fell asleep, and that, of course, foretells exactly what's going to happen uh, on Jesus last night in the Mount of Olives. The same thing's gonna happen, isn't it? It's gonna take these three uh, to pray with him or be near him, and they're gonna fall asleep while Jesus is praying. In Matthew chapter 17 and verse five, Matthew makes another addition that would be good for us to look at. Matthew 17 and five says, while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them and behold a voice out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. So Matthew adds, to the story that it is a bright cloud, uh, kind of matching the brightness of the uh, appearance of these three. And then Luke, back in his account in chapter nine and verse uh, 34, and while he was saying this, a cloud formed and began to overshadow them and they were afraid as they entered the cloud and a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. So Luke also adds that the cloud didn't just overshadow them, but it also enveloped them. So it's kind of like they're being in a fog, but a very bright, brilliant fog. So it would be very hard for them to see at that, at that point. If we read on in Luke's account, it also tells us that uh, they didn't come down from the mountain until the next day. Uh, so this was not necessarily an event that happened quickly and was over with as we tend to think if we just read through Mark's account. Uh, the cloud no doubt represents the divine glory and presence of God as he is the orchestrator of all of this. Uh, they, so when, after the cloud envelops them, they can't see uh, Jesus anymore. And, uh, but they hear this voice saying, this is my beloved son. Notice that Luke added to that 
This is my chosen one. Uh, Matthew says, it, with whom I am well pleased. And all three accounts, they say, it says, listen to him. Pretty much the same thing that God said at Jesus' baptism, isn't it? So God is saying here that whoever hears and listens to Jesus, hears and listens to me. Jesus brought the words of God to earth. So listen to him is probably the most important part of what we're seeing here. I mean, it's interesting to see and talk about transfigured bodies and what we might look at, uh, look like in the hereafter. But the important words, the most important words are listen to me. They had heard Moses uh, as he represented the law, the pe God's people. They had heard Elijah representing the prophets and now they must hear Jesus. So a lot, of, a lot of significance to what's going on here. Now Jesus has become the lawgiver, replacing Moses. And uh, he is now the prophet, uh, replacing those like Elijah. He is the one who speaks from heaven. He is the one who is the mediator of a new covenant. Just as Moses was the mediator of the law, Jesus is now our mediator. And uh, no one points that out better than the Hebrew writer. So let's look at uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and uh, verse 22. Hebrews 12, verse 22. You have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking, for if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less shall we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. So after these events, uh, the cloud disappears, leaving the apostles face down according to Matthew's account and uh, very afraid. And Moses and Elijah are gone at this point. Matthew's account, back in uh, chapter 17, verse six. It's good to read all these accounts together so that you get the full story. Matthew 17 and verse six. And when the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were much afraid. And Jesus came to them and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. And lifting up their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. So once the cloud passes, they are again alone with Jesus. Luke's account, chapter 9 and verse 36 And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and reported to no one in those days any of the things which they have seen. So Jesus tells them uh, not to relate the story until he has risen from the grave. And uh, as we just read in Luke, uh, it's verified there that they obeyed their Lord. They did not say anything to anyone about that until after the resurrection. Um, they did tell about it certainly then. Uh, Peter, who of course wrote uh, two epistles of his own, if we look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16.
For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven and we were with them in the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. So Peter very eloquently in his own epistles relates the fact that yes, he was there and uh, he didn't understand all the implications at the time that he was there. But now as he writes his own epistles, uh, guided by the Holy Spirit, uh, he uh, certainly understands how, what a powerful moment that was and that, that he was witness to it. So it was indeed a most powerful and compelling event. Uh, it's always going to burn in the minds of these three apostles throughout their lives. And as we finish up uh, this passage this morning in verse 10, it's pretty remarkable, isn't it? That these three men who are the closest to Jesus still do not understand what he means when he talks about rising from the dead. You look at that last verse of this passage, verse 10, and they seized upon that statement, the statement that he should rise from the dead, discussing with one another what rising from the dead might mean. So Jesus has told them plainly several times now, and still they don't get it. Now we just read in Peter's own epistle, he certainly had it by then, but at this time, right after the transfiguration, they still don't understand that Jesus has to die and that he's going to rise from the dead. He told them very plainly about it only a week earlier. Remember when we talked about uh, Peter rebuking Jesus for talking about dying? And then Jesus had to rebuke Peter and say, get behind me. And uh, they, still, they still don't understand it. At least Peter was smart enough not to rebuke Jesus about it again, wasn't he? Uh, getting rebuked by, by Jesus' state, I imagine, kind of stays with you. And Peter didn't want that to happen again. So they only talked, it, uh, they only talked about it among the three of, the, of them. Uh, they didn't, didn't do it in the, in the uh, earshot of Jesus, at least. The whole purpose in having them present on the mountain uh, seems to be just be, so they could get a vision of what the future glory is going to be. Now, they get to be the only witnesses to that because they certainly at that time did not understand its meaning. They were just overcome by it. They were terrified. Uh, they didn't know how to act and they didn't get it. But they did remember it after Jesus' resurrection. And after the Holy Spirit came upon them at the day of Pentecost, and they fully understood. In turn, as we read it today, it gives us a clear idea of what we shall be like when we see him as he is. Because I think our bodies are going to look like uh, his body and that of Moses and Elijah as they are described here as that we also shall be transformed into the likeness of the Son of God. So uh, I'm, I'm pretty happy about that. Like I said, and I might like to have a, a little different face and maybe not be so recognizable, but uh, I know most of us are longing for that time when we can reunite and reconnect with those who have gone before us. And I, I think this passage gives us a great hope and evidence that that is indeed going to be the case and that we will have these glorified, marvelous, dazzling looking bodies and that we will know one another. So uh, I hope that you've 
enjoyed this lesson with me this morning. The Transfiguration is a great event, uh, a remarkable event. Uh, next time we will uh, begin with uh, verse 11 and uh, study down through about verse 29 of chapter 9 if you'd like to be preparing for the coming week for that lesson. Uh, it's always a great joy with me to be able to uh, study through this with you. And uh, again, I look forward to the time when we can do it in person. But uh, I, I still feel that we're having some valuable time here. And I appreciate all of you out there who uh, uh, help me along in this and you comment on the lessons. And uh, I feel free to do that. Uh, text me at any time if there's anything further you'd like to discuss in them. And uh, I look forward to being with you next week. Goodbye.